These basically represent kind of decreasing areas of specialization. So AI on the outside is really anything where we're getting a computer to make intelligent decisions, which there is a specific definition for, but it's not really important. Right. Um, then inside that, there's machine learning, which is getting a computer to make those decisions by learning from examples. This is how most AI is done today, because it turns out it's much easier to have a computer learn to do something by seeing examples than it is to code it by hand. Inside that, there's representation learning, which is basically saying, okay, here's, a, here's an image. I want you to learn some things about the image, but I'm not, going to, I'm not even going to tell you what to look for. I'm not going to tell you that you have to look for edges or shadows or areas of color. You have to figure out what to look for. And then in the middle, there's deep learning, which is a way of doing that. Deep learning uses something called a neural network um, with many layers, um, over a thousand layers nowadays, to come up with a, um, a, a rich structure of representations. Right. So for example, for an image at the bottom level, it'll learn to recognize all by itself edges and gradients. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, it's gonna be able to recognize um, noses versus eyeballs and at the top it'll recognize the difference between Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, you know uh, Katy Perry yeah. um, for me deep learning is the really exciting thing to look at because that's the thing which has led to state-of-the-art results uh, in areas that we never thought computers would be able to handle in our lifetime and it's been able to do it in, in three to five years so that's totally revolutionized our understanding of what's possible. Makes sense. And so, you know, there's a lot of talk around like tech companies, you know, investing big in, uh, yeah, any one of those forms, particularly deep learning, you know, like Baidu, Google, Facebook, they all seem to be like having some sort of effort towards that. And then, you know, increasingly there's a lot of early stage startups that are just getting started. They're like, seem to be investing in this some way, shape or form, you know, consumer company that invest in having some recommendation features, you know, powered by deep learning, uh, or, you know, pure plays, you know, people that, that, that are building kind of deep learning stacks and trying to sell support and services around it. So do you feel like that hype is, is justified? And, and I guess, you know, the more important question is like, what do you think that's happening all of a sudden right now? So, sudden. so to me, the, the potential for deep learning is, as we sit here, is greater than the potential of the internet was in the early 90s. And I remember people asking me the same question in the early 90s about the internet. It's like, the internet is so hyped. It seems like everybody's talking about the internet, you know. And it, there's no way it was overhyped because it was very clear that it was going to impact every part of our economy and our lives. Right. It's equally clear that deep learning will impact every part of our economy and our lives. And I say that not as a wild guess, but we know from academic research that every area that people have looked at with deep learning rapidly becomes the state of the art and gets well beyond what people ever thought was possible. Right. So for example, better than human capability at speech recognition in Chinese and English, right. better than human capability at recognizing the content of photographs, um, cars which drive more safely than the humans human, do. Yeah. So whatever you know, for anybody who's watching this right now, whatever it is that they're doing, they will be doing it assisted by deep learning right. in the not too distant future. It, anybody who's not doing it with deep learning is gonna fall by the wayside, just like right. booksellers that didn't use the internet right. fell by the wayside. So it's not, you're not gonna have a choice to ignore it because we, we know mathematically that it can solve any given problem. We know empirically that it is now solving complex problems better than people or any other computer system. Um, and we also know that doing it takes a very, very short amount of time, yeah. both to compute and to develop, because we don't have to hand write any programs, it learns it for you. Yeah, you were giving some examples, and you, you know, I think you were saying in an earlier conversation that um, you know, it takes about six months, something on average, for like, somebody to start applying deep learning tools to like, some industry, some domain area, and start yielding results that are well, better than less, what was you know, like I, I started a medical company. Uh, there was four of us, none of us had any medical background. And within two months, we had built a better than state of the art, better than human radiology system for identifying malignant cancer. 
And that, if you identify lung cancer early, your probability of survival is 10 times higher. So lots of people have been studying this for a long time. You know, we felt a bit like frauds going in and like studying lung cancer as non-medical people, but we knew from the research that deep mining works and lo and behold, it, it worked again. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's something that non-experts, non-domain experts can quickly apply uh, I've seen it applied recently to weather forecasting by people who aren't meteorologists. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it really changes the nature of expertise and the nature of kind of what's, what's possible by for small numbers of smart people. That makes sense, right? And so, you know, we, we talked about this, something I, I never really kind of appreciated, you know, the, the opportunity, I guess, of deep learning that you, you don't need to be a domain expert, you don't need to have this pre-existing knowledge, you know, and anything that maybe deep learning itself to be able to go and like maybe start finding innovative solution, whether that's for you know cars or medicine or, or any one of those things. Although I actually, nowadays I'm thinking a little bit differently again, yeah. which is that domain expertise is really valuable for knowing like what problems need to be solved, what are the constraints on solving those problems, whether they be regulatory or you know personnel based or whatever. <laughs> and you know, what are the problems worth solving? And the thing that I would love to be able to do is, you know, have the people that know the answers to those questions, i.e. the domain experts, I would love it if they had access to deep learning themselves, right? Because at the moment they don't. At the moment, deep learning is really pretty inaccessible. It really does require a fairly significant level of knowledge of programming and math. And a lot of the information on using it effectively is kind of locked up in people's heads. Right. It's part of the kind of artisanship of designing these architectures. Right. So, you know, my my big hope of like what I I hope fast.ai can contribute is to make it so that domain experts can say, okay, I'm working on a system to identify um, a crop disease, right. say, you know, and uh, figure out how to deal with it, uh, you know, to improve uh, uh, food availability in India, I'd, I'd love it if that right. person could be like, okay, I'm just going to go do that right now. Makes sense. Yeah, and it's really, you know, you're right, there's a lot of obstacles on the technology itself, which is why, you know, I personally find a lot of those pure plays of building a, a great kind of deep learning technology stack very interesting because there's so much to do about like the, the user experience of it, right? How do you, are you able to use it and apply it to your industry and to your problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there will be that much in the way of pure play deep learning companies any more than there are many pure play internet companies today. Mm. You know, I remember in the early days of the internet, everybody was setting up like internet service providers. Sure. Whatever. You know, everybody wanted to be an internet company. Um, I think there will be very few deep learning companies. You know, there will be one or two, and the rest of us will be, ho you know, hoping to build something more like Amazon. You know, a bookstore on the internet. You know, so it might be like a medical diagnostic company using deep learning or a weather forecasting company using right. deep learning or a agriculture optimization company using deep learning. No, that makes a lot of sense. But so let's talk about kind of more about opportunities for startups. You know, one thing that seems striking in a lot of these, um, you know, machine learning, deep learning type of uh, conversation is the advantage of having a large data set. You know, and you look at Google and Baidu and Facebook and all those people that have large quantities of data, personal data, and they're able to very quickly train their neural nets and, and deliver great I, I Can I just, I mean, I just want to interrupt you. I, I just, I hear this so much and it drives me crazy because okay. it's just not true. Okay. You know, um, there, you know, when at, at Analytic, my previous company, right. when we built our lung cancer model, we had a thousand examples of people with cancer. Okay. And this was much harder than most things because these are three dimensional CT scans. Also much harder because nobody has really studied these with deep learning before. The reason that this kind of false meme has appeared is a couple of things. The first is that anybody doing their PhD by definition is trying to push the technical right. envelope. So they're trying to work on levels of scale that people haven't worked on before because right. that's how you get a PhD. And then after that, they go and join Google or Facebook. They have Google and Facebook sized data sets and they try to solve Google and Facebook scale problems. Right. To me, the opportunity for an entrepreneur is the opposite. It's to be able to say, okay, what do you know about? Like maybe you're um, 
you know, your mom's a real estate agent and you know a lot about that, or, you know, maybe you've spent your last 10 years doing network security and you understand denial of service attacks or whatever. Okay, go do that with deep learning, right? Like whatever it is you do, do it with deep learning. So you could use deep learning to figure out, you know, the right amount to sell a house for, you can use deep learning to automatically figure out, you know, that a particular packet is from a DOS and to figure out what the optimal set of rules to block it is. Um, you're not going to need ridiculous amounts of data because what you can do is you can leverage the stuff that Google and Facebook and those guys have already done. Mm -hmm. They've already built networks which will be 90% of the way there. Right. And then that last 10% you can use your few hundred examples right. to, to get there. close the gap. No, that makes sense. It's called transfer learning. So right. transfer learning and fine tuning are the critical things for entrepreneurs who are interested in using right medium-sized right. data sets to solve problems they're interested in. No, that makes sense. And then, you know, it's it's not so much about, you know, like, necessarily, like, building the best possible answer, but, like, knowing what question to ask, too, right? And yeah. that industry-specific right. knowledge is, is right. where you can shine, where, you know, Google might be and distracted by And this is what all entrepreneurs, things. you know, try right. to learn right. is, is to use their particular knowledge, you know. So, like, even for me, I spent 10 years in strategy consulting. And so, you know, one of the things I know a lot about is how kind of domain experts work in lots and lots of types of companies. And so now I'm thinking like, how do I build something to support those people who I understand really well and who I know? So yeah, you know, this thing I did with medicine is kind of a bit off that standard chart. And that was because, you know, I really wanted to study what's possible. Right. Um, but I think for, you know, if you're focused, you know, and I already built three startups, so it wasn't like I was kind of trying to do something easy and quick. I was trying to do something slow and hard. <laughs> yeah. um, but I really think, you know, the right, the right approach is still the same, which is follow your passion, follow your interests, follow your knowledge. You know, you know what are the bits of your industry which everybody hates, right. you know. And uh, if you could use an algorithm that could, like, solve any problem better than it's ever been solved before, which... Right. You probably now can, right. you know, what, what could you do with that? You'll have to unlearn a lot, right. you know, like all the things you thought were constraints, right. all the things you thought were hard. If you thought, for example, that weather forecasting requires $100 million of, um, you know, fluid dynamics uh, hardware, you know, forget it, right? right? None of that is useful yeah. because you can learn it in, yeah. I believe, less than a second is how long right. it takes to do yeah, with it's a It's shocking, you know, really how much, you know, sometimes you, you get unexpected, you know, results and shortcuts through, through some of the early deep learning examples we're already seeing. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, thank you so much. So how did you guys manage that process, right, of like, okay, you're a young company, you're, you're a few years old, you have a bunch of small customers at 20 bucks a month, and you're already in so many different markets and you have to deal with so many different uh, countries. So, you know, our approach is always you have to ruthlessly prioritize. So the list of things you need to do is always longer than the resources you have available to do them. And so early on, there were some things that we chose not to do. And I think because we chose not to do them, it helped us succeed. So yes, we were global from very early on, but we did not, we, and to this day we still don't, although we should eventually, we only sell in US dollars. Because it's simple. It's simple. It's like, this is what you're signing up for. And so we, we didn't do the work to say, if you're buying in France, here's you know the euros, and if you're buying around the world. Now, I think that there's a way to optimize that. And going forward, there's definitely optimizations we can do. And we'll get a lift if we start to sell in local currencies. But early on, we just said we don't have the resources to do that well. So it's OK if we don't do it. If someone really wants it, they will sign up for it.